Hi, I'm Chris Garcia, half of uh, We Architecture Think Tank together with Natalie Frankowski, and you're watching A Student's Perspective. Thank you for tuning in tonight at A Student's Perspective. I am Jen, and tonight I'm here with Cruz Garcia. Um, Cruz, if you wanted to go ahead and introduce yourself a bit, maybe give a little bit of information to you. So I'm a um, designer, architect, theorist, writer, artist, creator, teacher, uh, uh, originally from Puerto Rico, and I've co-founded with Architecture Think Tank in Brussels in 2008. I've been practicing in China and in Europe and now in the States for some years now, together with my partner, Natalie Frankowski. Awesome. Jack of all trades. <laughs> you definitely dabble in a little bit. Master of none. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just if you wanted to tell us a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up, where you went to school. So I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. I went to school also in Puerto Rico in the Universidad de Puerto Rico, uh, 10 minutes pretty much from where I grew up. And it's a um, university that is really important for the country because that's where like the real uh, political imagination is formulated. So it has been really a center that has been really important because of the amount of sort of uh, uh, intellectuals and artists and writers that work and teach there and do research there, but also because it has been at the forefront of all the like, struggles of resistance against neoliberal forces and forces of privatization and so on. It's a public university. Um, so it kind of represents the, the sort of the public interest in a way um, like uh, maybe none other institution does in the country. So it's a really political institution. Uh, and I had the chance to like experience that while studying there. Uh, so that's really a fundamental part of my sort of education. And, and also it relates a lot to, to how I see the world in a way. Um, and just to give you a bit of background. So I studied in Puerto Rico and then Natalie studied in France. She's from originally from uh, a town called Joan, and she went to school first in Saint Etienne and then in Paris, uh, and then we met in Brussels in 2008 during the financial crisis, and then that, that's when we founded the Way Architecture Think Tank. Awesome. So, I mean, I definitely appreciate the perspective on your school and the education that you were brought forth from. Um, if you wanted to explain, because you did just mention Natalie and meeting her a bit, what caused you guys to start Way? So it was, um, I mean, it was in the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, one of the financial crises, there's always one. Um, and that exposed a really problematic relationship between neoliberal capitalism and architecture. So it's almost mm -hmm. like an, an inability to think critically about what we do and more like a, a service to, to, to capital in a way. And that's something that we really disagree with. And really early, you know, when we met just uh, out, out of school, we were thinking like, whatever we were working, that's not what we want to do as a practice. Okay. And we know that what we want to do is like question and to like write and to, you know, to be in a way at odds with the status quo um, and, and generate a way to practice architecture by questioning. That's why way means what about it. That's the, that's the acronym. So it's basically asking asking questions before 
giving an answer or, or proposing a solution to something. So that's pretty much been like the, the, the philosophy since the beginning. And I think it, it, it remains like that and perhaps has intensified with the years where we find more ways to ask more questions, right? And, 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 and more tools to represent those questions. So it's a continuing, continuing evolving sort of approach um, that has pretty much nothing to do really with style or with, you know, um, superficial things that have to deal with architecture, but rather with a really fundamental philosophical question that is to do with the being critical, right? And, and mm -hmm. find ways to deal with ideas about human emancipation. I really like that, especially because everything boils down to that um, behind the design process, behind what you see and the pretty things. It is about the questions and the design process involves a lot of that. So I definitely respect that that has brought about your entire mission, if that's a good way to put it. Um, would you describe in any way something else as being your core values or would you say that's kind of primarily what you drive your practice with? Well, th that's like the framework of the practice, but then between be, uh, like within the practices, all the forms of practices, right? Like the outreaders platform we run, or like we used to run a gallery in Beijing called Intelligentsia Gallery, or our artist practice called Garcia Frankowski, mm -hmm. or the many other projects we do. Like we have a collective called Post Nobi, so. A plinth rises, reaching upward, realizing potential. It does not, cannot touch the ground. This architecton is a representation of the wall, which is a symbol of the deliberate exclusion of the less privileged by the more privileged. The wall in the case of this architecton is also a subtle reference to Matt Lombichi's black square. Limited by the restrictions of the ground, phallic structures have become mundane and repetitive. Humanity has become lost in these environments, stripping them from individuality and freedom while losing their sense of emotion and spirit. A floating architecture which graces the landscape rather than disrupting, can bring back the empathy originally instilled in architecture, freeing humanity from what they once were. There are always ambitions to build a new world in a way that strips the old world from their old traditions and habits. Zaha Hadid says that modernity was also aborted by a changing government or war, so these revolutions were always curved or stopped. The cross as a form has strong association with religion and tradition, similarly as in the 0 0.10 exhibition. Malavish hung the black square in the corner of the room in the traditional setting of the religious icon. The focus of the spire is a model representing pure form and composition of simple architectural elements. It visualizes the placement of linear structures with natural lines and shadows that can represent architectural shapes and form, simplifying concepts of symmetry, mass, density, and the use of negative space. It is composed of the way where the voids have equal presence to the elements that create them, forming a cohesive whole of parts with present and absent in the composition. This architecton represents growth, a progression through the past, present, and future. The architectons are a commentary on the commercial practice of architecture today. The first shows the intentions of design and the ideal of symmetry and idealized values. The second represents the unintended progeny that manifests and mutates in the negative side effects that the original architecton generates. depending with whom are we working, there's there's different type of questions and different type of approaches. And so that's we're collaborating with people that may have a slightly you know, different approach or different questions. But the idea is that for us, that's the fundamental part of it. Uh, and, and for us, uh, you know, if we think of the word critical in relationship to critical theory and the origins of the word, how it's, how it's used in the, in the humanities and in philosophy, uh, we, we think that the only way for architecture to be critical is when it's dealing and engaging with ideas about human emancipation. Um, so everything else, you know, you cannot make a critical drawing if it's not dealing with human emancipation. Maybe it looks critical to some people because they think that critical is an aesthetic or, or, or um, like a, a process, but actually it is, you know, it has to deal with that idea of human emancipation and that's really central to us, right? Um, and and there, there, there are many different struggles of emancipation, right? And we can think about, you know, critiques of transfeminism or anti-racism or anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, right? Like ecological justice. And I feel like all those points that allow, that allow for different imaginations and different forms of practice. So it's not like one question, right? But there is a, 
a, a broader approach that deals with all those issues in a way. So with all of that in mind, is there a project that comes to mind that maybe you can elaborate that this human emancipation has come into play? Mm. Well, I think the role of education is really important in that. That's why we teach in a way. Uh, but also like a series of our publications, they try to deal with questions of power and how to challenge power, subvert it. Um, uh, our, one of our recent books is uh, post-colonial, it's called a planetary wretched, a post-colonial narrative architecture poetry book. So that deals with so ideas of sort of uh, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. We are working on an upcoming book um, dealing with the figure of, the, of Lisa Capetillo and the Loud Readers. And she was a anarcho-syndicalist, feminist, uh, utopian, you know, uh, creating, uh, helping the workers organize, right? And, and ask for better rights and strike, you know, and, 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 and challenge power. Um, and in a way, I feel like many of the projects we're doing, they're trying to deal with many of those approaches, sometimes directly through our own work or dealing with people that are, that are dealing with this in their work, right? Like working with a trans poet that is questioning, you know, the role of capital and coloniality in the construction also of things like gender and things like that, or working with people that are act doing activism in the streets. Um, or, so, so it's not necessarily, that we have to be the, the idea of the authorship, but it's like finding also who's doing this and, and finding ways that we can have a, a dialogue and, and, and find ways where we can keep on spreading those networks of solidarity and keep on pushing those ideals and, and those struggles forward, right? So like every opportunity we have on like publishing platform to curatorial practice, to our role as, as, as people, um, you know, I don't want to use the word citizen because it can, can, has been co-opted, right? To, to think about nation state, but the idea of, of being, you know, part of a, of a society and a community, uh, that's also part of that role, right? So it's not just something that is academic or, or architectural, but it's something that is part of our life every day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really amazing because the timing of this interview, um, just everything that's happening in the world, I feel like everyone in my generation has been starting to speak about the things that are unspoken. And I think that this interview specifically can touch base with a lot of watchers, just because you're touching on these heavy topics, but bringing it to life in a way that can really hit home for people. So I definitely appreciate you explaining that a little bit more. Um, and you did mention you are a professor. Can you tell us a little bit about where you teach, um, your role as a professor, just because I can definitely tell you make a meaningful impact as a professor. So I'd like to hear a bit about that. <laughs> so <laughs> right now we are, we, both of us, Natalie and me, are associate professors in, uh, in Iowa State University. Um, that is a land grant university in Iowa, in Ames, Iowa. Uh, we've been also teaching parallel to here in another land grant university in the U University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. We've been doing a series of like seminars on post-colonial landscapes and like Critique of Black Square to Black Reason. Uh, and before that, uh, we were teachers also this past summer in the Master of Science in Columbia University in New York, where we also had a chance to explore some of these topics, particularly in the, in the context of New York, uh, exploring the colonial footprint of those institutions. I think that was a really amazing project where some of the students were really engaging even with Columbia, right? Like seeing like mm -hmm. how toxic Columbia is in New York. Uh, or the Metropolitan Museum or Guggenheim, MoMA, all those things, right, that we kind of idolize, but we don't look at critically. Uh, last year, we were also teaching um, in the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, that is Virginia Tech. Um, and before that, we were in Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, in the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and in the, what it was then known as the School of Architecture at Taliesin, or the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, or now, you know, the, I don't know what's the name, they, they changed the name and they kind of got kicked out by the foundation, part of that sort of neoliberal struggle against education. Uh, mm -hmm. But apart from that, we always do in like uh, um, workshops in different universities around the world, like, you know, in Africa or in China or in Europe mm -hmm. or in, in Latin America. 
And we also run an alternative um, free and accessible online trade school of architecture called Outreaders. Uh, based oh, on the tobacco uh, fact, uh, tobacco readers in the readers in the tobacco factories like Luisa Capetillo that I just mentioned. So that's like a parallel, free online accessible architecture school in a way that everybody can follow. Okay, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I didn't know that you guys had done that. Yeah. So in March 2020, when all the American universities freaked out and sent everybody home when COVID mm -hmm. uh, first uh, strike in the US, um, we noticed that many students were kind of left hanging, like especially like international students or students that didn't have a home to go back. Uh, right. and, and they were like, you know, okay, university is closed. So, you know, we keep your tuition, but then you deal with that, right? Like you figure out what to do. Yeah. And we're like, this kind of sucks. So uh, we try to put into practice some of the things that we believe in that is like uh, um, we appropriate the, the tools of the of those institutions and use them for something good mm -hmm. uh, so, so we started I think in March um, we kind of created this school called Loud Readers that is based on the lectores the tabacalera mm -hmm. that are the loud in the tobacco factories in the Caribbean in the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century, uh, many of these people are the this, this former slaves or children's, children of slaves, right? Like, so they are like, they have no access to education. So these workers that used to work really long journeys, uh, in the, in the, they used to do like many hours working, rolling cigars or picking up the, 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 the leaves and so on, uh, repetitive manual labor. Um, they would choose one of their own that knew how to read, to read for them during the entire workday. And at the beginning, the readings of these lectores were like classics, you know, like Dostoevsky or Victor Hugo or like whatever you can imagine, right? Like that they can read. Uh, but people like Luisa Capetillo, um, they were reading political literature uh, like Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and uh, Pyotr Kropotkin and Mikhail Bakunin you know, anarchist and syndico anarchist and communist texts, you know, like mm -hmm. things for the workers to organize. Yeah. And that, that helped create some form of uh, anti-capitalist imagination. And, and what was interesting is that the workers turned the alienating labor of rolling cigars into their, their own salvation, right? Because that allowed them really to pay attention to these radical readings. And the result was, some historians call it the most uh, enlightened proletariat in the 20th century. Like it was uh, thousands and thousands of workers that were uh, being educated uh, in mm -hmm. politics and in the humanities while working. Um, and also they were organizing, like they were, they were syndi syndicalists and they were like asking for better rights, not only for workers, but for even people that didn't have any employment. Uh, and they were like in Puerto Rico, there were tens of thousands of, 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 of people striking. Um, and of course, you know, they found, they, they, they gained some rights, but the practice became illegal, right? So people were persecuted and shot and arrested. Uh, Lisa Capetillo is a really important character because not only was she a loud reader, she was also like, uh, like I think like the icon, right? Of, uh, she, she used to, she was arrested several times for wearing pants in public uh, because it was uh, in, for in, in, indecency, you know, back in the day, women couldn't wear pants. Right. But she would wear pants, right? And she got arrested. And also, she wrote utopias about workers robbing banks and living happily ever after in the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, and she wrote utopias about free love and feminism. And she she used to also like she was a loud reader in Puerto Rico, in Cuba, in the in the New York, in Durham. So in New York, she used to run a vegetarian restaurant um, and and a boarding house, and she would rent rooms of her boarding house to other workers and she will serve also what other people in the for example in the Bernardo Vega that is another you know former slave uh, revolutionary used to say that the, the meals she prepared in her restaurant were amazing delicious right so uh, she will serve uh, delicious vegetarian meals to workers even if they didn't have any money so based on those principles of, of, of you know, uh, uh, mutual aid in, in the anarchy, anarchist philosophy, they, they will actually practice it, right? Like through the networks of solidarity. 
So based on that model, right, Capetillo being like at the center of that, we we call this school Loud Readers. Uh, and if you go to the webpage that is loudreaders.com, um, you see all the sessions, the lectures, the readings, the workshops that have happened, the publications, the exhibitions that we have done with speakers from all around the world that join us in this sort of loud reading platform. And it's always free and accessible online. In the summer of 2020, we ran an experimental 10 day school with three sessions per day. And we were there like 10 days consecutively with speakers from all around the world and students literally from all around the world, right? Like everybody was joining in, listening to the lectures, doing the workshops. And the next day, you know, again, like three sessions per day. And then we've been since then sporadically doing presentations, but also creating a free and accessible also online, online uh, library where all the books are shared and so on. So people can follow, you know, um, I know ATH open a platform now called uh, women writing architecture. Although I don't think it should be women, it should be maybe women and trans people. I feel like it's still mm -hmm. a bit exclusionary. Uh, yeah. But we managed to like you know create our own uh, reading list from the loud reader series, right? Not only with the text that we would recommend, but the text that m m many of the loud readers we have invited have recommended, right? Like including is a wolf joining us from Cape Town or Raquel Salas Rivera joining us from Puerto Rico or Liu Yu Jia joining us from Beijing, right? So we have like artists, poets, philosophers, um, talking about depth, talking about colonial depth, talking about uh, emancipatory practices, anarchy, uh, communalism within architecture, uh, curatorial practices, you know, like, so it's a really diverse uh, pool, uh, you know, about collective forms of writing and so on. So, so that's, that's what Loud Readers has been since, uh, since March, 2020. That's amazing. And I hope that it's uh, been a successful rate and just keeps growing because first of all, thank you for explaining that story because that's extremely inspiring. And there's always this one driving person that tends to lead the force for everyone to be able to follow and recognize that you yeah. have to step up the zone and kind of speak. That case is right? two people. <laughs> yes, true. Exactly. So it's really inspiring to hear about that. And your platform kind of having footings throughout literally the entire world, like you said, it's amazing because other countries, some people literally can't say something without stepping out of line. So yeah. having- And even like, I remember like uh, one of the examples of when we were doing that, uh, there were Brazilian students. And I remember in Brazil, some of the schools, they, the universities, they closed and they didn't even tell the students they were closing. So people were really left in really precarious situation in like really alienating sort of uh, situation. Yeah. And even if we don't have like a mainstream, like a media channel, I think like just through like our social media and the web pages, people mm -hmm. still know, notice, right? And they, even if they don't join live, they can join and, and listen to these things like later, right? So it's, it's part of that idea of, of sharing. That's an amazing outlet to have. I'm really excited to hear about that. And I hope everyone does go check that out. If you want to repeat that website again, it was loudreaders.com. Awesome. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to go take a look at that. I probably will right after this. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited to hear about that. And I don't think I realized that you had not only played so many roles elsewhere, but then you also kind of took COVID for a successful way of kind of approaching what they were. Yeah, like universities just kind of outcasting and on your own way you go, we're not really gonna help you. We're yeah, just gonna it was you. really it was really brutal to see that. Yes. Especially and, and also the funny thing is that the ones that started it were the most powerful universities, right? Like the want the ones with the most money, like Harvard and IT. Yeah. They were really quick, like, okay, there you go. It's like then you realize that they never really care about you. They are they are literally yeah. war, war machines and and real estate developers that happen to teach sometimes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's that's as a role of the university, especially in the, in the American context in a way. Yeah, and of course you come across professors. I know I have several professors here that will sit down and be a mentor role for you, but then there's oh, other totally. professors that you're right, they're just coming in collecting a paycheck and you're just kind of a- Yeah, step but step even at, at the end, it's not even about the professors, right? Because there are many professors are also in precarious state, like they also yeah. like overwork, they also don't have many benefits. They uh, have to adjust to being online. But I, 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 what I mean by the university is not the professors. I mean the university as the institution, right? Like as the, as right. the, as the endowment, as the administration, like high up, right? Like it is yeah. a completely yeah. different machine. Uh, yeah, I know professors that they would like, you know, not eat to, 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 to give to students, right? 
or mm -hmm. or or people that are like really in precarious situation, especially at joint faculty in many of those prestigious universities. Um, but I mean more like the the university as the as the as a machine, right? That 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 is really problematic. Thank you for clarifying that because I do agree with that as well. It's kind of just money grabbing and on your own way you go. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the professors are making so much money either. <laughs> yeah, and there was also a lack of um, communication for them being able to even, they had to adjust to being online professors yeah. and that's not what they went to school for at all. Imagine so. like a professor, like, you know, those persons that are, you know, more advanced age, you know, with a precarious mm -hmm. uh, health condition and family, right? And having to like go through all that still you know i feel like many of my colleagues are going through hell in a way because the university mm -hmm. put them in a really difficult situation right. right so were you guys teaching before covid hit at what point did you start teaching at iowa state well so we have, we just arrived to iowa state in august uh oh, this okay. year okay sorry in tw last year 2021 so we were in pittsburgh in teaching in carnegie mellon when when covid uh, uh, Striked, mm -hmm. um, and we were teaching a seminar called "From Black Square to Black Reason," and it was we were discussing all the things that happened later in a way. So it was like mm -hmm. really interesting to see the class shift on to online, but right. us in the studio and in the seminar doing all these readings about necropolitics, about um, right to live, the access to health. Um, structural racism like white supremacy right like all these things we were really like engaging with them so i, I feel we had a really nice uh, library uh, sorry reading list once covid strike right like i feel we were really prepared and that also helped us uh when i was in pittsburgh back then it was a uh, black lives matter too and it, and it was in the streets we were like going in the streets i remember the first saturday that we didn't have loud readers i was in the streets with the activist friends and people like, you know, with, with the real police there kidnapping people in front of us. Yes. So it was like from talking about it in class to figuring out like, how is this helping us understand what's happening to seeing it unfold, like literally there, right? Like in, in front of yeah. you. So it's like a real uh, material manifestation of all of this, mm -hmm. right? Um, so so being, I, I think like being in Pittsburgh was really fundamental too, right? Because Pittsburgh was in a real political transformation at the moment. Yeah. Right now they have the first black major in their history or something like that, right? But we were, when we were there, they were like protesting a uh, new police station that they were building in a black, in a, in a, in a black neighborhood, um, uh, understanding the role of gentrification, understanding the role of, of the university where I worked, in Carnegie Mellon, right? Like Carnegie Mellon was developing predictive policing software. They were selling to the police to brutalize black communities there too, right? So it's a direct relationship between the institution that is not only extracting and gentrifying, but also providing software to further brutalize communities to keep gentrifying, right? So it's a, it's a continuous cycle of extraction taking place. And, and in a way it's like, as you said, when you mentioned the professors, uh, like my colleagues were protesting that too, right? Like they were saying like, this, this is terrible, right? And, and I remember that same year, this all connected, right? That same year, some of my colleagues have already uh, kind of denounced that the first year admissions, whatever, they were distributing a map of Pittsburgh that have wiped out, erased all the black neighborhoods. So it was a map of Pittsburgh and it had like five or six gaps Okay. Uh, they were giving that to first year students and it was literally eliminating all the black neighborhoods. So it was wow. like, and they were saying this is so racist, you cannot show this. And then yeah. somehow it got out to the press and then they have to make a public apology. But then you realize like when COVID came and Black Lives Matter happened, the, the university was so odd in all that situation because they, they're obviously part of the problem, right? Even mm -hmm. if we are from within the university to trying to think critically about these things, we are working for an institution that is really problematic, right? right? And I feel like being in Pittsburgh in that period, it was really fundamental also to try to understand, right? Like the role of these institutions in their communities in the framework of the United States. That's absurd. The fact, I mean, that was probably a really hectic time for everybody considering you're right in the heat of it and then you're seeing it. I mean, the seminar being at that time, unfortunately, yeah. um, 
again, brutal things going down, but also yes. really good information for them to have and to see yes. it right in front of them that this is happening and you need to recognize it and make a change, especially the mapping. That's just walking backwards in history. That That's yeah, insane. It's sort of ridiculous. I mean, it was, but also it's like, because they have some amazing professors there that, that work mm -hmm. with those issues too. They were, they were telling them like, you need to, you need to eliminate this map. This, you're distributing yeah. a really racist tool. And then oh, everything unfolded like one after the other day. The, the map was even before coming, right? Like, but it was yeah, already yeah. like in the radar of everybody. Like we are distributing such a racist map in this university. Um, and and as, as a university that obviously is benefiting and also problematic because uh, the, there's very few amount of black students, let alone Pittsburgh students, right? Right. Uh, so, so yes, you are a problem, but then you're also creating some form of weird white, white supremacist propaganda. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you're also selling predictive policing software. And then <laughs> there were, uh, at the same time, it's all like, I mean, and again, I'm using that one as an example, but this can be seen in, in many other institutions, right? Right, I'm sure. Uh, there were, there were, they were appointing as a fellow, this guy, I think it's called Richard Grenell. He's like a really racist politician guy as a fellow in one of the institutions in Carnegie Mellon. And people were protesting like, at this moment in time, why is this guy being brought in? But the women that brought it in uh, was one of the you know, people that used to work for Trump, right? That they have like okay. a, a appointments in the institution, right? So then you realize like, doesn't matter how much we talk about symbolic yeah. gestures, real power still there on the yeah. roof, right? Like they don't care, right? So it, it is kind of like really contrasting in a way. Yeah. And it's crazy how a lot of that can be behind the scenes because how many <laughs> things do you think we don't even know about? Like they had to make a public apology, but that's because they were called out for it. Let yeah, alone I mean, at the end, they didn't apologize. They say, no, like uh, we, we, we want freedom of, uh, they always use that uh, kind of bullshit term, like freedom of, I don't know, freedom of information or freedom of education or freedom of, I don't know, but, but false education, it's false information. Yeah, but also it's like always, they always use that to defend really yeah. right wing racist people. It's never to defend right. Angela Davis, for example, right? right. Angela right. Davis got fired by the university. So every time that these things are brought up, they're obviously to defend status quo, to defend mm -hmm. white supremacy. So they're yeah. really one sided arguments, even if in, in, on paper, they look like they could be applied to everybody. They're not. They're not. They're not employed like that, right? They're. Mm -hmm. They're not used like that. We we saw already, you know, with the uh, Nicole Hannah Jones or with the Cornell West, right? Like when they go for tenure, there's always a reason why they're not tenured. But there's always mm -hmm. like these really exceptional black people. They will never be in favor of the institution, right? But right. on the other hand, we have all these other terrible people that already got the position and we didn't even notice right so it is mm -hmm. like that's that's how the freedom of academic uh uh, uh whatever is, is is displayed in a way mm -hmm. so you express all of this and have been able to share this information through seminars and so on but i also kind of want to dive into a bit about the way you express these movements through your artwork because i know you deal with mixed media a lot both you and yeah. natalie i would like yeah. to hear a about how you, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or a, a climate justice, whatever type of social justice topics you have, yeah. kind of dive into about that? Yeah, so again, like depends on the media, depends on the context, depends on what, like, what we're trying to address. Like recently, like last year, because of the sort of conversation and the sort of impasse that we were having, you know, talking with some people, especially faculty or conservative, like a very conservative faculty, we had to publish like a manual of anti-racist architecture education, for example. That, that's one type of work that is really specific uh, mm -hmm. on the setting of education and the setting of like the institutions and so on. But we've been working, you know, for some years, especially since, since, since coming back from China with our sort of what we call the post-colonial method where we try to use landscape representation, landscape representation that has been historically used to create some form of uh, settler colonial propaganda uh, and try to subvert it by reinserting political narratives in them. So it's not just about the beautiful wilderness and the landscape, but rather talking about the militarization of these landscapes, like how they are tools of empire, how they further expand the colonial imagination and also how they're, they have 
how they have been historically used as tools for erasure of indigenous people uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and black subjects, right? So, so that's, that's something that is really important for us, especially in that work. And it's a work that we use through teaching, but also through practice where we are reclaiming those landscapes in the images and collaging over them all, all the sort of political content, right? Like all the statues, all the, all the propaganda, all the, mm -hmm. all the reading lists, you know, we have a collective called Post Nobis that means like post-colonial Unobis, borrowing the name from the, from the collective in the People's Art School in Vitebsk. Um, and, and part of the loud readers comes from there where we, as a collective, you know, more than us, you know, a, a couple of writers and artists working together, imagining these scenarios where we are reclaiming those landscapes, right? And, and that's something that we keep on working on and, and presenting it to students and trying to find out how can we keep on adding a, sort of a repertoire of images that talk about erasure, that talk about settler colonial imagination, right? In a critical way, how can we recognize that images are always political? not mm -hmm. only because of what they show, but also because of what they leave out of the frame, right? Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and how can we instrumentalize that and use it like actively, right? As a, as a tool to create narratives and, and to subvert narratives and to start that conversation. And we started that work, I think like when we came back around 2018 and, and 17. Um, and at the beginning there was not, <laughs> not much audience for it, I felt like, we were showing things like this in Nebraska and the students, of course, they're enthusiastic and all that, but like the architecture community was kind of like, uh, they don't care, right? I feel like right. now it has, it has changed, right? Like the perception has changed, particularly because young people, they're not, they're tired of the, of the nonsense, right? So mm -hmm. I feel like they're paying much more attention to works that have been more critical, right? With, with history. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I like how you said that what's left out of the picture because it is so embedded nowadays in popular culture, whatever it may be, just the representation of minorities being like, this is so specific, but in Kenso, like that's such a popular movie right now, but they took the minority. Which one? And, in Kanto, it's a Disney movie. It's an anime ah, movie. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw so, kind of like the images. I haven't seen it yet. So I don't know if you did see that. You should take a look at the movie. It's really good. Um, and the movie is definitely fighting against the, the norms of what, these Disney movies are portraying. And I think reflecting that back to your artwork and kind of uh, specifying what is missing, they are, a lot of people are making movements and changes to try and actually highlight what has been missing in the past. And if you look back, it's almost, it's really easy to miss that it's missing because it's, it's not there. So yeah. what is it is to start highlighting yeah. it, make priority. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy that you explained that the way you did. Thank you for that. Um, do you have a project or an artwork that you'd like to elaborate a little bit on? Because we could always kind of display it on the screen for our viewers here. So we've been working on a series of, um, so again, we call it the post-colonial method. Um, and it's basically explaining how do we use uh, certain images and certain references in the work to create those arguments of erasure, of sort of occupation, of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing workshops where we invite students, for example, to say like, you know, so knowing your context, knowing your history, what would be, what would be a, an image you would make, a postcard, let's say, that you would make that relates to, that follows that post-colonial method that, that allows you to imagine what is it that, um, that you want to show, that you want to display, right? That has been forgotten from the images. Uh, and maybe what I can show, uh, let me, let me, so yes, we have one that we are about to publish in the upcoming Perspecta uh, magazine. Uh, and it's a play, a post-colonial play. I'll share with you some of these images um, where every, every image is, an action that is taking place. And all of the images are done uh, by reclaiming some of the paintings of the Hudson River School of Painting uh, and some of the sort of 
uh, icons of architecture history that has been really mm -hmm. important. So I, I'm gonna share it with you two works. So this is the, the play that I was mentioning, mm -hmm. um, that it's um, a series of images, right? Like the settings of these images of the Hudson River School. And then we borrow like a bunch of things from like Russian avant-garde, from our own uh, sort of uh, narratives, from the Bauhaus, all the things that we are kind of criticizing or subverting or reclaiming. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and telling stories through these actions, right? In this case, one, every action is for every, every dramatis personae, for every character. Uh, there's a loud reader, a poet, a sculptor, a filmmaker, and they're actually real people that actually are all of that. Um, and every image is charged with all these references. Um, references to our own work or to like former presidents or to like racist okay. slave owners and, and, and you know, economies of extraction and so on. So these are all those um, That's uh, amazing. images, right? Like this one has the feminist propaganda poster of Posnovis with some of the members like Natalie, Ophelia, Hilary, uh, Rose, uh, right? And these are some of those images uh, that sometimes take place in the American Midwest or sometimes take place in Puerto Rico or in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Um, right, and it's all happening in this stage that is floating around. So that's one work, and the other work maybe I'll share. So we are publishing. Uh, when are we publishing this? We're publishing in the next issue of the Funambulist. That is a I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a French magazine of architecture that is about politics of architecture. Mm -hmm. And the next issue is going to be about land in the sense of give the land back, you know, right. and struggle, struggles of uh, decolonization. And, you know, Leopold Lambert, the chief editor, he had invited us to, to, to contribute a piece. And at the end, what we ended up doing was writing a letter to our daughter to explain her name, where, where does her name come from? Um, because she has a very particular name, like the first Emma with only one M is for emancipation. And then the second last name, the second name, Yuisarix, is a Afro Taino futurist name where it's taking parts from Taino and like other parts of other concepts and creating this name for her. And then we explain in that letter, you know, the struggles of emancipation behind her name and what does it mean in relationship to the land of the father, of her father and her mother and all those stories and how they embed and hopefully she'll be able to learn about that through her name so she doesn't have to rely on institutions telling her her mm -hmm. story. And then we, as part of that, we created three, three images. There are rooms for her that have objects that have been stolen from her culture or reclaimed. I'm not mm -hmm. sure which um, so these are the images and they are all borrowing like from her family stuff to things about Puerto Rico or like, uh, you know, um, the transatlantic slave trade or, mm -hmm. or the sort of uh, political literature that deals with the sort of uh, struggles of liberation around the world through even the history of plantation economies in Puerto Rico or like feminist struggles and stuff like that. Uh, and he has all this sort of real history in the image. Uh, so yeah. she should be able to see, you know, in relationship to the text, all the fruits and all that that you see there, they are actually from still life paintings of one of the, maybe the most famous Puerto Rican painter that is basically just trained in Europe and has a very particular way, kind of colonial way to see Puerto Rico, even if he was Puerto Rican, in mm -hmm. a way, but it's a very Europeanized Puerto Rican. Uh, or very European Puerto Rican. Uh, and, and then we, we take all those things and create this image of, a, of, a, of three rooms in a plantation, right? And the image, like especially this one, comes from this image that you see up here. Mm -hmm. That is a painting by the same painter about this black, black t-shirt that used to educate the children of former slaves and poor children in the countryside in Puerto Rico. So it, it still has to deal with that idea about education, right? Okay. You can see, you can see in the wall like 
pictures of two of the most uh, important revolutionaries in, in the Haitian revolution or Taino, uh, our indigenous people's uh, 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 spiritual artifacts or Yoruba and Igbo artifacts or, you know, Amilcar Cabral, really important Pan-African uh, revolutionary uh, from um, Guinea or Luisa Capetillo that I mentioned, right? She was arrested for wearing pants here. She is in a picture. And like all the botanical illustrations of the tropical plants and fruits that are actually the center of colonization, right? Like that's the reason why we are colonized in the first place because our land can grow things that are delicious or yeah. shiny, right? Like gold or, or sugar or plantain, chocolate, you know, all those things. So, so all the rooms have that content for her to see, you know, um, her history somehow unfolding as part of that narrative. I really like that you guys did this and she's what, she's only a month or two old at this point, it's right? Two months, two months two old. Two months old. So that's fantastic because as much as we can say and hope that the educational system is going to improve and start shouting out the fact that this country alone has been it, it, like was built on slavery yeah. and it's it is hidden in textbooks it's not spoken about enough so yeah. the fact i mean that here in, in iowa is illegal right now to talk about it in school too so it's kind like, of interesting come on <laughs> so it is i really respect that because there is always in school you are asked what your name means and where it comes from and i can say my mom just liked the name meanwhile she literally has a whole research project and able to go into each of these pictures and be able to pull every each and every detail from it so yeah, yeah. i am inspired by this i'm excited for when she's grown up and able to <laughs> it is that is amazing that you guys have taken that approach for her um, it took I us a while to find the name so at least we can write the theory because it took us so long to figure out like it was her <laughs> name you know yeah. uh, no so, that yeah. is that is amazing. I'm very inspired by that. And I'm sure everyone listening is as well. Um, and are these, what website can we go to to see everything that you have? I mean, you've displayed so far. Is there a website that kind of accumulates anything else that you have to show? So Way Think Tank is our main webpage. Okay. Uh, WAI Think Tank that has most of the lectures and projects there. This one is not published yet because it's going to be out in the, in the spring in this in the i think in march in the march okay. issue of the finambulist is gonna be out and then we, oh, we got a big. sneak peek <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and the, i think the letter is nice right because it's it is a letter for her but it's a a history letter right talking about colonialism it talks about the role of the university and the fact that we work there it talks about prisons talks talks about museums right like uh, all the institutions that um control either the land the body or or your history in a way um mm -hmm. and so so that's part of that and then loudreaders.com has all these amazing resources resources right like where you can follow all the lectures and the workshops and then there's there's a garcia frankowski that that's more where like our artworks are but they're more like not necessarily architectural so there are three different platforms that we have and okay. then there's a four there's a fourth one that is intelligentsia gallery that it was our curatorial practice while we were in beijing so but we think tank is the one that has the most uh, content, like probably this will appear there at some point, right? For okay. now, it's, we're waiting just until the issue is out. Um, really, really excited about that. Um, also for her, you know, when she grows up, when she can read it or we can read it to her, mm -hmm. it should be interesting, right? To, to, for people to understand, you know, why she called like that. Absolutely. What's her name? I don't know what my name should have been, right? Like, I'm sure it's not Garcia, right? That's my last name. So at mm -hmm. least, you know, we, however, we can control like the first names and try to have some say in the narrative. Yeah, maybe, absolutely. Maybe that. You're doing whatever part you can play in order yeah. to progress forward. I, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that with us, yes. giving us a little sneak peek again. That's awesome. As much as I want to keep going with this interview, because I feel like there's so many layers to go through with the two of you. You guys have done an amazing job and put a massive footprint onto this generation. Hopefully you've changed views of the older generations that seem to be pretty stuck in their ways, but yeah. I really respect what you guys are doing um, to reel it back into the students listening and watching right now. 
Um, just what's one piece of advice you would give yourself if you were to be a student again? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a piece of advice I would give to myself as a student. Mm. Don't believe everything you read. <laughs> that's a good one. It's very common theme of our interview today. <laughs> Yeah, I think like at, at some point when I was younger, particularly in architecture school, I also had like the eyes feel of glitter when I think about all these amazing architects and then you don't understand the role of empire in their, in their positioning and why they exist, right? Like why do we know so many Dutch and Spanish architects but we know none, none from Haiti, for example, mm -hmm. right? There's a reason for that. And then sometimes I miss my, uh, even if I'm, I, I was still an angry young person too, like in the sense of like, uh, you know, I, I grew up again, you know, in a really political environment, but mm -hmm. sometimes it escapes. You think that these people are real genius and they're not. Um, they're just an appendix of, of empire. And I, I wish, I wish maybe, I, I don't say I wish I knew it earlier because I, I think like every decision, every step I took is like, I'm here because of today, you know, and, Exactly. And we are we are here today. Like we we met in in Belgium. Right? If I don't go there, that doesn't happen. Um, but I would let's say I would say that to young people. But they have to read in order to not believe what they're reading, right? So yeah. on one hand, is not to abandon the reading. I feel like that that's also a problem sometimes that people may think that because things are stuck, they should stop learning about it. Can you hear me? Yes, it's, it's frozen. Do you see me moving? Oh, I know I see you. There you are. <laughs> you froze completely. <laughs> yeah, same. You, yours were frozen too, so I don't know. Um, uh, last thing you said was not to abandon. And go ahead if you wanted to continue. No, 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 I would say like, I would say read more like to people. Like, it's not like, uh, yeah, the Eurocentric canon sucks. And there's many other things to learn but I would read as much as possible of everything and then be really prepared to dismantle all that stuff. Thank uh, you. I feel like not engaging with many things may be problematic on the long run, right? Because it doesn't really equip us with critical perspective. Right. You can't just dip your toes in. You have to do your own research and really... Yeah. The internet is a massive tool, but you can see one thing on social media and it's totally false it's just not true at oh, all yeah so. like there's no filter right so yeah i think like it, it and that's something like our students you know struggle especially you know the ones former students that you know come back and they ask i don't know where to look right like i don't mm -hmm. know where to look for information and it's, it's it's real the problem right like it's difficult to find where are the reliable sources what what is worth looking at what is worth questioning but I say like to get to the level of being critical and be able to discern, we have to be informed mm -hmm. and we need to start the earlier we start with that, the better. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we already touched on what websites to go to, but yeah. what social media can we find you guys on? Well, I'm mostly in Facebook with my name. Okay. <laughs> and in uh, Instagram with uh, Garcia Frankowski. Uh, I think that those are the two that I use the most. Everything else I have it, but I don't really use it. There's so much time in the day to be posting stuff. Yeah. There's so many different social medias and yeah, and I think like it, focuses on a different group of people. Yeah, I think Instagram, sorry, Facebook is more like older people, but uh, because I don't live near my family, it, it allows us to stay in touch with also with other intellectuals, mm -hmm. particularly like, uh, you know, writers and stuff like that. There are a lot there and they share and they're really you know, engage in sharing what they're producing and things that are mm -hmm. happening. And it's still kind of like people that you accept. It's not like everybody. Uh, and Instagram is like really image driven. So it's kind of superficial, but it's also kind of fun. So those yeah. are the two, like all the other ones, I think I'm a bit too old to be engaging <laughs> with them. But I know they exist and people use them like TikTok <laughs> and Snapchat and whatever. Oh my God. Yeah, that's going really. <laughs> but it's not really my realm. I That's think I was, okay. I was born before all those things became something, so. <laughs> and they're escalating quickly, so I definitely understand not. <laughs> yeah, and it's so many of them. They keep on appearing and disappearing, oh, so it's like. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for tuning into a student's perspective. This was Cruz Garcia. Uh, it was a wonderful interview. I hope that you all tune in next week for another episode. Thanks for watching. Thank you.